Welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Dr. Emma Brzezinski, and this week I'm talking to the fantastic Alex Suyong Kim Pang, whose book Rest, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less, offers a radical approach to work and productivity. And we talk in the episode about the relationship between rest and deep thinking and creativity. But we also talk more generally about the academic culture, about navigating the job market, about overcoming a culture of feast and famine. And most delightfully, for me, we talk about the importance of napping. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, Alex. Hello, Emma. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, your book Rest is truly awesome and was a real game changer and eye opener for me when I read it. And I find myself recommending it to lots of PhD students because um, they're in that culture of where overwork is a badge of honour and they're just exhausting themselves um, and they're not getting much done. And so I know you have got so much wisdom on this topic, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you about it. Oh, great. So am I. Um, But before we begin, I always ask people about their own experience of um, graduate study and how you got into the work that you do now. So um, my graduate study... uh, First off, I did a you know a, a doctorate in history of science, and wow. um, my actually my my father is an academic, though he's a he's a Latin Americanist, works on nineteenth century Brazil. So um, okay. uh, and so you know for me, um, uh, grad sort of going to going to graduate school is part of you know a grand plan of sort of going into the family business. Okay, and <laughs> so, you know right or. And, um, you know, right or wrong, I assumed that this was, you know, something that, uh, something that sort of, I was going to, you know, kind of, uh, or move straight into and, you know, have a career that, you know, sort of was your kind of recognizable academic, you know, sort of academic life of the mind. Um, and so I was in grad school for five years and then did a couple postdocs. And by that time it was the mid nineties. And, you know, the sort of predicted wave of um, retirements at that time Mm. that were supposed to clear the way for a new generation of scholars, those retirements were happening, but replacements were not, right? Um, Or of academia, at least in the U.S., was discovering that it was possible to simply, um, you know, close down lines and make people adjuncts instead. And so after several years on the market where... Um, I applied for everything that I was remotely, and sometimes I do mean remotely, qualified <laughs> for. Uh, I decided, you know, it, it was it was becoming increasingly clear that the window was closing um, for getting a job, and basically I got lucky and got a sort of uh, got a position as managing editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which at the time was moving into being a being a from being a print publisher to a digital publisher. There weren't that many people who had any sort of expertise on this. Um, I had designed a couple course web page, websites, which really were just you know, you know, folders of web pages. But you know, in 1995, that was like this incredible thing, <laughs> um, and it was you know enough to get me sort of to get me out of academia and into you know into the corporate world. Um, from which, you know, and so, you know, since ever since then, I have um, worked first in publishing and then as a technology forecaster and consultant and have for the last few years been also you know, um, returned to being a writer. So um, I've f- published this spring the third of um, three trade press books about 
technology, work, and creativity, this one being uh, about um, the shorter workday, the four-day week, which is kind of a sequel to rest. So um, I, I suppose that, you know, in a way I've managed to kind of by, uh, maintain a little bit of connection to the academic world, enough so that, you know, I have uh, so that I've got at least access to the things that are cool about it and the resources that allow me to do uh, to continue to do interesting work. Um, and, you know, also to maintain a sense of kind of the life of the mind sort of outside of you know, the sort of conventional structures and reward systems of professorships, you know, et cetera. So that's who I am. That's so useful because as you outlined that the climate has changed, is still changing. And lots of people I know listening to this will be thinking about how to navigate that landscape. And I think it's really useful to hear people, people's stories and how they, how they have done that. Yes. Um, and I think that, you know, there is I not uh, sort of I'll try I'll try not to interrupt too many times during our conversation. Oh, no, I'm please sorry. do. <laughs> but, you know, I think that or we, you know, we still have this language around sort of a crisis in the humanities or a crisis in, you know, the historical profession and hiring. And I think that what that misses is crises actually come to an end um, and you go back to something you have an opportunity to go back to something like normal. And this crisis in the humanities is one that's been going on for 30 years. Right. Um, th you know, it's not a crisis any longer. And I think that, you know, one of the things that is inc that should be extremely clear to everyone is that um, uh, even if the institutions that train us are unable to, to come to grips with this reality and change the way that graduate education works, or at least, you know, change the change, change normative assumptions about what people do after they finish their degrees that at you know, the individual and the kind of collective graduate student level, we need to, uh, to recognize that our career trajectories probably will be rather different. But that does not mean that the things that you like most about the life of the mind or scholarly work must be uh, or, uh, inaccessible to you. Um, I think that the you know one of the things that um, that I have learned is that the life of the mind has a kind of portability about it that um, uh, that uh, that we need. We need to recognize and we and we need to disaggregate the pursuit of that from the pursuit of sort of the of you know, of sort of professional advancement. Um, those are two rather different kinds of things, and you can have, you know, and just as you know, we probably all know sort of some. Uh, you know, it, well, it's po you know it's possible to pursue one even if you don't have the other. Mm, I love that. The portability of the life of the mind. That is definitely another podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Um, and so on this theme of the portability of the life of the mind, uh, what I love um, about, the, well, there's many things that I love about the book. Also, uh, what I love is that you seem to love napping as much as I love napping. That I love. Um, <laughs> but but there's a brilliant chapter called The Science of Rest. And this the, the book is so thoughtfully and elegantly researched. Um, and I'd, I'd love I'd love you to just say a little bit more about the research that went into um, what well, the scope of the book, the research mm -hmm. that went into it. So um, the scope of the book is. Uh, it's about the hidden role that rest plays in the lives of super creative and prolific people, by which I mean um, you know, successful politicians, Nobel Prize winners, famous writers and composers and artists, um, even a few generals. And what I was interested in here was under was kind of, of um, analyzing the uh, analyzing the place of leisure and downtime and apparently unproductive activities in the lives of people who probably most of your uh, uh, listeners would um, admire and like to emulate. Um, 
and I started getting into this because of when I started looking at the kind of daily routines of, um, you know, particularly sort of scientists and scientists and writers, uh, mainly because these were people whose biographies I happen to have easy to hand and realized that, you know, these are people who organize their entire lives around their work, right? They make choices, you know, about where to live, sometimes about who to marry or whether to marry based upon calculations about how that will affect their, or, uh, their ability to pursue stuff that they're really passionate about. But when you dive into their daily routines, you discover that they don't spend their entire days working. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, they spend several really intensive hours at, you know, at of uh, the lab bench or or the blackboard or at their desks they spend an awful lot of time doing what seems like um unproductive time they also have spend a lot invest a lot more in serious hobbies than you might imagine people who are potentially locked in priority disputes or trying to finish the next serious novel would spend and so the effort so the so the effort of the book is to explain why it is that those those things actually matter, how they make us more productive and make us better people, and how we can translate some of those learnings into our own lives. One of the foundation points for the book is literature from the last 20 or so years about the science of rest. First off, um, the role that sort of unstructured free time um, plays in helping us be more creative. And I think the two big things that, uh, that, uh, that the research teaches us is that first of all, our minds actually have an awful lot going on during those unstructured periods of sort of in which we allow our minds to just wander. Um, and that, when you when you look at what's going on in the brain in those moments, um, or the brain moves into or sort of switches on what neuroscientists call um, the default mode network, which is a, which turns out to be a set of connections between creative centers in the brain and or sort of the visual center um, memory, such that its people are able or the mind when people turn their attention to other things continues to work on outstanding problems or unsolved problems that have recently occupied their conscious attention. So the very simple example of this is something that happens to all of us every day. You know, or if we try to remember say, you know, who was, you know, who was the actor who was in that movie and the TV show that had that, you know, that song and, it's on the tip of your tongue and you can't quite remember a few minutes later, you're doing something else. And all of a sudden the name pops into your head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the default mode network continuing to work on problems, even while you're doing something else. And when you look at the daily schedules of very creative people, one of the things you find is that they kind of layer periods of really focused, intensive work with periods that give the default mode network time to do its thing. So, you know, they will work intensively for maybe about four hours or so, and then, you know, go for long walks or work in the garden or do other things for a couple hours and then come back and maybe spend a little bit more time and of cons sort of essentially consolidating or writing down or working out some of the ideas that they had when they were sort of off in the garden or out on the walking path and want this. And so this leads to a kind of working rhythm that is, to, you know, in the eyes of someone who's lived in Silicon Valley for the last 20 years, you know, for who, you know, and who was very accustomed to thinking about, you know, serious creative work as something that requires super, super long hours mm. and a lot of sacrifice mm. as, you know, this is a style that seems incredibly luxurious and humane and also sort of quite sustainable, right? This is a way of working on things that you really like in a manner that does not put you at risk of, you know, of being overwhelmed or burning out, um, but allows, but allows for, a kind of sort of marshalling of your resource or sort of conservation of your resources that 
makes for a far more sustainable kind of life and career. Um, and then there's also other research about the value of other kinds of rest, such as, you know, our one of our favorite things, mutually, naps. And, <laughs> Love and a nap. The, you know, and there's some, there's been some, there's been some very interesting stuff about the restorative value of naps, about how naps can play a role in um, memory consolidation. So taking a nap, you know, for example, people who are trying to learn a new language um, are more likely to remember new vocabulary words if they take a nap not very long after, you know, sort of uh, after studying, you know, going through a set of flashcards, for example. And so you know, rather, and that, you know, and for a tiny number of people, naps also can serve as a kind of creative playground. Um, Salvador Dali, for example, was sort of had, um, worked out an entire method for kind of, uh, for capturing, you know, capturing visions that sort of surfaced during naps. And mm. he described, he, he just, he has an amazing description of this in sort of in, in one of his books, you know, likewise, um, vacations, sabbaticals, there's a whole body of research that shows how it is that these things actually turn out to be really valuable, both in the short term and in the long run for helping us do better work, have better, deeper ideas and, um, sort of, you know, and finally help us have better, longer lives. So that's the science of rest. Mm, and I just, it's so compelling and that, and particularly interesting, I think that relationship between rest and creativity, and you talk about that a lot in the book. Um, and yeah, I think there's really, really interesting things to explore there. Um, and I now want to ask you to take all of that gorgeous stuff <laughs> <laughs> and to... Um, to really think more particularly around the PhD. Right. Because we we here to talk about PhDs and we we know that graduate school, doing a PhD study, that there that is not a restful culture. Um and you said something really interesting when I approached you about um talking to me and you would said something about seeing rest as part of your professional identity I loved that and I'd, I'd love you to say a bit more about about that and what you see in that so you know, I, I think first of all you're exactly right that um, that graduate school is not designed to be a place that gives you a lot of opportunity to rest nor is academic culture now one that uh, the sort of that uh, that has much respect for rest or for downtime, right? No. For all, you know, for all of the stereotypes that the rest of the world has about, you know, fuzzy headed academics who, you know, sit around all day and kind of think deep thoughts, but never do anything um, from the inside. It looks dramatically different, right? Mm -hmm. It's a kind of never ending swirl of, you know, grading grant proposals, you know, hustling for the next thing, um, dealing with, you know, dealing with graduate students, with undergraduates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum. Exactly. You know. I love napping, but I don't get to nap. <laughs> no. um, and I think that the sort of that, you know, one of the biggest changes in academic culture in the sort of in recent decades has been that kind of the cult of overwork has become as well established in the academic world as it is in any, you know, any corporation or you know, or of hedge fund or startup, um, the assumptions that, you know, l that long hours are both a kind of career def differentiator and source of strategic advantage, mm -hmm. that they will lead to higher levels of productivity, which then will in the, you know, sort of ruthless, but meritocratic world of academic job hunting and promotion leads to a more successful career. Um, these are, you know, these are, these are ideas that, uh, sort of that, 
you swim in from your first day of school until, you know, sort of basically for the rest of your life. Um, but I think that the, you know, one of the things that ha and one of the things that happens as a result is that we really downplay the importance of sort of downtime for sort of, uh, in both our personal lives and our professional lives. But there is a great line by um, Amos Tversky, you know, one of the inventors of behavioral economics and uh, sort of had this fantastic line where he said that, as Richard Thaler reported, that people waste years because they don't waste hours. The idea behind that being that, you know, you need to take some time to just let ideas percolate, to play around with crazy things, to see and to sort of, you know, take, take what might seem like weird little insights and give them a little time to kind of develop and expand to see what happens. And that if you don't do that, you can be incredibly busy, but you will do work that has no consequence whatsoever. And I think that we are really, really good at the busy part. Um, the problem is that, you know, that busyness often comes at the cost of consequence. And that I think is the great, both the great risk that we run, um, individually and also the great, you know, I think the great risk that uh, sort of that universities run, um, sort of as a whole, uh, you know, that they become, they become places where, you know, our citation scores go up, but the importance, you know, the ultimate importance of the work that you do, um, sort of goes down. But I think, but, you know, to return to the order to the, to the, to the personal level that, you know, what, what Tversky points to is that, yes, it is really important to read a lot of stuff, right. To think, you know, to sort of, to master literatures, to learn kind of the craft of, scholarship or of science. But at the same time, it is also important to give your, to give your mind time to let that stuff settle, to consolidate what you've learned. Um, at a very practical level, you're more likely to retain often very difficult, very detailed ideas. If, you know, if you literally sleep on them, um, that more, you know, and that over the longer run, once you are, you know, once have mastered that material, you are more likely to do really interesting things with it. If you give yourself time to kind of just let it play in your mind. And so I think that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that is the big, that's the big lesson that we learn from, um, Tversky and sort of everybody else who's had insight about this. Yeah, uh, I was really you know, taken in the book that you you talk about productivity peaking at about four or five hours per day. Yeah, um, and it's that is very different to the to the narrative that is that's played out, and people right. not taking weekends and you know just keeping going late into the night. Um, whereas actually, perhaps you will do your best work within four hours. Yes. No, no, you know, fun and fundamentally, you know, the idea that or if, uh, the, the more hours you work, the more you will get done is something that is true for very short bursts. Mm. Um, you know, we can sustain those sorts of hours around exam time, but it's not something that you can do year round. And fundamentally, you will become less productive. Um, you're more likely to burn out. You're more likely to you're actually more likely to cut to cut corners and to cheat if you are feeling stressed and burned out than than if you're not. And so, you know, what you are what you are doing is recognizing that um, you will be better at this and more productive and do better work in the long run if you make space for rest, if you take it seriously. Um, you know, despite what every graduate program tells us and that, you know, then you will, if, you know, if you assume that um, you need to, you know, you need to, you need to get four hours sleep at night and you'll sleep when you're dead. <laughs> well, look, and I think that 
what you just said there about the kind of around exam time, I think that's really important that people come into perhaps come into PhD study with those skills that they had as an undergraduate, which is very much kind of feast and famine um, Mm -hmm. that you kind of study hard for the exam, get the essay in. Whereas actually, as we always say, you know, the PhD is a marathon, is not a sprint. And you need to have, as you say, sustainable ways of working. Really important. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's very true. And um, one of the things that I have seen time and again, both in um, biographies, but also in you know my own consulting, is that incredibly smart people have to learn about this the hard way. Um, you know, whether it's because you've been able to do well enough sort of having kind of raw intellectual firepower overcoming the deficits of bad planning and or to poor habits or whether it's something else, you know, very often we get into our, we get into graduate school or, you know, our twenties or thirties still doing, still acting like we can, we can get away with the same things that we did when we were, you know, when we were 18 or 19. Mm-hmm. And, um, there comes a point where that really no longer works and you got to find something different. And well, you, you give us all the research and all the information that shows us why this is a really smart way to go ahead. Um, so again, I'm going to ask another impossible question, um, mm-hmm. but we always ask people at the end to, if there's any kind of top tip, any the the one piece of advice that you'd give um to t- to take away from your whole body um, of research one piece of right you know i think um that uh, if there's if there was one thing that i would do um i would um have the thing that worked best for me in graduate school um, was when I was living on my own, um, I turned my, I turned my bedroom into my office so that I could close the door on the work. You know, I was writing, but you know, I would be done and then I could just shut the door and I didn't have to look at it. Right. All my materials were in there and, um, having the, and the thing is that, uh, or what I learned from that and what, and what subsequent research teaches is that having having those boundaries, having the ability to turn off is actually a very, very valuable discipline. And it is a discipline in the sense that it is challenging. You have to learn how to do it. There is practice involved, but you do get better at it. And as you get better at maintaining those boundaries, the quality of your work and the quality of your thinking also improve. So whether it is a literal boundary in terms of a door, whether it is temporal, you know, sort of having um, sort of hard and fast rules about not working after X o'clock or on, you know, or being, being as rigorous as possible about taking every Saturday or every Sunday off, um, whether it is, in the sort of in the form of you know of sort of uh taking regular vacations um have that kind uh, have those boundaries thank you so much that is very very good advice um and as you say hard perhaps to you kind of had to practice it to um to make it into a habit but um that is golden alex thank you so much thank you for this brilliant book thank you for coming to um speak to us now and um thank you all for listening and i'll see you next time thank you emma